Welcome back to Speaking Queerly. We're a podcast hosted by Kaleidoscope Youth Center, which is Ohio's largest and longest standing organization serving and supporting LGBTQIA plus youth and young adults. Um, I'm Mallory, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Civic Engagement and Advocacy Manager here at KYC. And I'm Daria, I use she, they pronouns, and I am the Ohio GSA Network Manager at KYC. And today we're joined by two incredible guests from Columbus Public Health, and we wanted to bring them on to kind of start the conversation around LGBTQIA plus health. And of course, a lot of that is going to relate to sexual health. And we know here in Ohio, um, there, there's not a set of health standards, health education standards that folks are taught in schools. And we know that sex ed is, you know, we take what we can get, right? And what we get is not that robust in public schools. And so we wanted to, uh, you know, start this conversation here with folks from Columbus Public Health and talk about an issue that's impacting our community here in Columbus and more broadly right now. Um, so before we get into that, why don't you two introduce yourselves? Oh. Hello, my name is Chinieri Newsom. Um, she, her pronouns. I um, am a daughter, a sister, a mother, a friend, and a student. And I am a public health advocate at Columbus Public Health um, in our sexual health promotion department in wellness services. Prior to working at the health department, I um, once upon a time taught high school um, and most recently uh, worked in corrections with community-based correctional facility. And I have been with CPH for five years. Wow, you've lived so, so many lives, I love it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, my name is Chuck Miller, I use he, him pronouns. I am also a program manager at Columbus Public Health. Um, in the past, in public health, I've also worked in the city of Cleveland and in the city of Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, so I have at different points in my professional career been in public health as well as in nonprofits, most recently with the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society in community engagement and fundraising for cancer cures and patient services. Um, when I was younger, uh, because I'm an older gay male, um, I remember the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, as we were calling it then, and uh, being very active in our communities and helping us to actually have access to medications and services that were denied back in the 1980s and early 1990s. Wow. So I'm sure this work is especially relevant to you then because, you know, I'm sure you've seen growing up the impact of not having that education and not having that outreach to your community specifically, but then, you know, wanting to prevent that from being the case forever, right? And wanting oh, to make yeah, sure absolutely. people have that. So talk to us a little bit more about like what brings you here today and, and what you want to talk to everyone about. Well, um, I'll start. So. We, for a number of years in central Ohio, specifically Franklin County, have had a very large number of sexually transmitted infections and HIV, and especially our gonorrhea and syphilis and chlamydia rates are pretty high. Over the course of the past three years, because of a lot of things that happened in society during the pandemic and people not wanting to go to doctors and not you know, being afraid to go to emergency rooms and a lot of things that happened all over the country, uh, in particular syphilis rates have skyrocketed nationwide, including here in the Columbus area. So um, what, what are some of the, like, you know, talk to me as if I don't know much about it, right? Because I think there's a lot of listeners here who, you know, for whatever reason, we have younger listeners who maybe are feeling like, oh, I don't want to talk to my parents about this. I don't want to talk to my health provider about this, right? Or people just say like, oh, you know, syphilis, probably everyone has heard of that, but like, what, what, what is, is syphilis? Right, yeah. exactly. What is gonorrhea? What are some of these other STIs that you're speaking of? So I think it's funny that you said syphilis. Everyone has heard of that. <laughs> I would say nay. Oh, okay. No, no, yeah. Mallory. I'll be honest. I've been watching Grey's Anatomy, and <laughs> and in season like two, someone has syphilis, and I'm like, I don't even know if I know exactly like what that is, like what the symptoms are, like. So you, yes, yes. yes. So I, um, like I said in my intro, I've worked at Columbus Public Health for five years. Before coming to Columbus Public Health, before being a part of our sexual health promotion team. You know, I didn't know anything about syphilis. I had honestly thought that this was an infection that has went by the wayside. We have a cure no one talks about. 
syphilis. Mm -hmm. Hence, I think, why we have such a skyrocketing number. So syphilis is a um, sexually transmitted infection. Um, it is a bacterial infection. It is treatable. Mm -hmm. um, and it is more prevalent than what a lot of us think. Syphilis goes in stages. Syphilis is often called the great imitator. It kind of looks like everything. So this is why it's the great imitator. So it goes in stages. So in the beginning, um, an individual could experience a sore um, at the place where they have sex. So if you use your mouth, your vagina, or your rectum, a sore could appear there. Hmm. Problem. Yeah, the problem with the sores, though, is, is they're not always in places that are visible. And about half the time or more, people don't feel them. So if it is inside of the body in particular, um, you know, on, on female anatomy, it could be in the, up inside the vagina near the cervix or in male or female, you know, in the rectum, you're not going to know that it's there. Mm -hmm. It can even be missed in the mouth or the tongue and it can actually look like cold sores on the lips mm -hmm. and people think they've got cold sores. Um, and the problem also is they go away pretty quickly one to five weeks and they're gone and people think they had something else, but it's gone. I'm not worried about it now. Sure. And, and they didn't know what it was. So my question then is if it goes away that quickly and people don't, they might not even feel it. They don't realize they have it. What, what's the risk? You know what I mean? Why is it so important that people take action and get treatment? Because when you have the signs and symptoms, you are most infectious at that point. But Chuck told us it goes away. So it doesn't matter if you put Neosporin on it, um, alcohol, because syphilis does what syphilis does, the sore is going to go away. And like he alluded, people think, poof, I'm cured. No need to worry. No, it can return, but in a different stage, it comes back in its secondary stage, which is a rash. Mm. The rash is kind of funky because it could really appear on anywhere in your body. Um, you could have it on the trunk of your body and think that maybe you've had an allergic reaction to a new detergent you're using. Um, it can appear on the palms of your hands, the bottoms of your feet. If you had a rash on the bottom of your feet, maybe you would think that it was athlete's foot. Sure. Certainly it's not syphilis. It's sure. on my feet. Um, syphilis can also cause your hair to fall out. Maybe you had a really bad perm or something. Oh, wow. But it goes in stages. So the sore may go away, but you give it some time, here's secondary syphilis. Wow. And, and there can be some other things too. It can look like herpes and it's mm -hmm. often misdiagnosed as herpes. Mm. It can look like venereal warts. Mm. Um, there, it can look exactly like venereal warts on, on both males, females, and on trans bodies as well. It doesn't really matter whose body it is or body mm. part. It can look like other things. And we see sometimes when we talk to people about their medical histories that they actually, well, I went to an emergency room where I went there and we check it out and they were misdiagnosed and not tested for syphilis because it imitates so many other conditions. And the other problem with those symptoms is they go away too. And so I guess I have two questions. So one, if these, if you're like in between these stages, right? And you don't have a, you don't have a rash that you see, or you don't have uh, a sore, are you still contagious? And then two, what is like testing for syphilis look like? Yeah, so you're always contagious for syphilis until you're treated. Mm. You are more likely to infect someone else with the bacteria or they're more likely to get it from you if, or, or, or to give it to you if they have certain symptoms, especially the ones that are like warts mm. and and they'll look like herpes because they're open sores and they're very moist and they have a lot of bacteria. <laughs> and I know, I know it's kind of gross. We talk about, but we talk about body parts. Sure, all the time. Right. You know? <laughs> look, I just fainted at the eye doctor. We yeah. know, so. See, and I'm the guy that would take you to do LASIK and watch them remove the flaps <laughs> off your eyes. So, no. so, so we're totally different people. Definitely here. not doing but, that. So we're, but. But we are used to talking about anatomy and we have to, and we're used to talking with all of our clients no matter what their age, their race, you know, if they're male, female, trans, however they identify as non-binary, it doesn't matter. Everybody has a body and everybody has parts on their body that, that, that they explore and that they use. And we just need to be free to talk about what's going on mm -hmm. so that we help people make decisions and also help people realize 
in the future that something could be happening with mm -hmm. their body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you asked, how would a person know? So if those signs and symptoms, and we saved you all by not bringing our pictures because <laughs> we have some amazing pictures that we could have definitely you shown you. Online, you right? Yeah, Google it. Um, how would you know? You have to get a blood test. A blood test, mm -hmm. okay. So you need a serological test where um, it is, you know, tested in a lab. You get um, your results that way. So it wouldn't be wise just to go off of looks. I think an experienced doctor, however, some of the doctors know, like they can eyeball syphilis from a mile away and say, I know exactly what that is. But a blood test is necessary. So okay. that is how you know. And you can get that as a part of your regular screenings. Um, advocate for yourself, advocate for a syphilis test. Maybe your provider isn't running it because they say you're not at risk. No, say, no, 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 you already have my blood. Go ahead and draw another tube for syphilis. I really like something that Chuck said is that everybody has a body. I think one of the things we do at the health department in our department is really try to take the stigma away from talking about sex, mm -hmm. from talking about sexually transmitted infections. Everybody has a body. You hurting? Yeah. Everybody's body needs to be taken care of too. And it's, it's not like, you know, you did something wrong with your body. No. no. Like everybody has a body and everybody is susceptible to these things. I imagine. Absolutely. Right? But one thing I'm curious about is like, who is at risk, right? You say like a doctor might say you're not at risk, but like, who could be impacted by this? Yeah, I wanted to address one other thing, if we could, about sure. how it's transmitted, because it does apply um, to, the, to the age of our population, sure. is during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for a number of years, if a person who is able to have a baby gets pregnant up to maybe even eight years after being exposed to syphilis, and they're not tested and treated in time, we see miscarriages, we see babies born with deformities, and we see stillbirths. And uh, because we've had so much syphilis going on these last three years in particular nationwide, including here, the number of babies that we've lost or that have been born with problems has really been unbelievably high. Mm -hmm. So during pregnancy is another way this is transmitted. Mm -hmm. And so for uh, anyone watching the podcast, if you are pregnant or become pregnant in the near future, for your own uh, health and safety and also for the baby, being in prenatal care where you're getting routine testing and you're watching your diet and doing all the things you should do when you're pregnant is advised because the testing will be done during the pregnancy. Okay. Wow. Okay. So all I'm birthing sorry, person. Oh, no, you're good. This That's is all important information. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, to, talk to us a little bit more about like who is quote unquote at risk for syphilis and, and maybe how it's like, you know, are, are there certain demographics that you see it come up more in or maybe uh, that you're not seeing it come up in as often because people aren't getting tested in that demographic? Like maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, first of all, if you have sex, you're at risk. Okay. Yes. Okay. Or it, sometimes people are forced into sex too. We know that. So you're at risk. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's had any contact with another person's body is at risk. Um, but then there are other demographics, obviously, where we see higher numbers or, or, you know, or you're more likely in that age group or whatever to, to have either gonorrhea, chlamydia or syphilis. I don't know if you wanted to talk about any of those. So right I away. think that so. um, when you said who is most at risk, um, African-American men, black men, who have sex with men are disproportionately affected by syphilis. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, as in a lot of other um, chronic diseases, you know, um, diabetes, for example, sure. you know, HIV. So there are groups that are disproportionately affected. So I don't know that I can give you the rhyme or reason as to why I could speculate sure. why. Um, certain groups are more disproportionately affected. But what we know is that that is the group that is the most affected. Um, as far as age group, Chuck said it, anybody who has sex. Mm -hmm. So yes, we'll see certain age groups have bigger numbers, mm -hmm. but I don't think that we should always focus on like that. Like if you are a youth, if you are a 13 year old individual who is sexually active, you are just as much 
at risk as a 42 year old sure. who is sexually active. The testing part is what's really important. Um, talking about it, having um, the agency to advocate for yourself and know these things. What would you say, Chuck? Yeah, I think that is true um, that we definitely have traditionally with African-American citizens and, and with males with HIV um, in teens, 20s, up to about 30 years old, a disproportionate number of, of guys who, who do get syphilis or HIV. Um, that's, that has been something that we, we've known for a long time. And there are, you know, people have interviewed people and, and done studies, some as not having access to health care, not trusting yep. health care. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and there are a variety of factors that go into that. Um, but every individual's decision about whether or not they're in health care and get tested is ultimately their individual decision. And we just are here to, to hopefully get people to think about, should I be tested? Mm -hmm. You know, am, if I'm sexually active, even if it's with one person or even if I'm wearing a condom, should I be tested? And, and on the subject of condoms, they work really, really well for a prevention of a lot of infections. Syphilis though, because of those open sores, if it is not completely covered, wow. You know, the, the, if the organ, like the male penis or wherever the condom is applied, is not completely covered and the sore is exposed, it can still be spread. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with oral sex, if people don't use condoms, mm -hmm. you spread it through oral sex. Mm -hmm. So so syphilis in particular is the one infection that condoms are not as great a barrier against, potentially, as with other infections. Sure. That's, that's great insight as well, yeah. too. Um, one thing you brought up, you said... This could impact a 13 year old who's having sex. This could act, affect a 42 year old, right? Anything in between or above and beyond. I'm curious, you know, there's a lot of youth who, you know, I can think back to when I was 13 and I absolutely would not be even like saying the word sex in front of my parents, let alone like talking about things that, you know, like getting tested or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And so, cause there's that stigma, there's that embarrassment or whatever, mm -hmm. especially if you're a young person. But if there is a young person who wants to get tested and maybe they're on their parents' health insurance or something right. and they're worried about, oh, I don't want my parents to know that I'm having sex or, you know, I, I don't afford it. I can't like, afford it. Or like, I don't want to like face that stigma. I don't want people to think, oh, well, you have an mm -hmm. STI or whatever, right? Not that that means anything wrong, but these, these beliefs and, and uh, worries are there couple questions like if somebody wants to get tested do they need parental consent before they can get tested like what does it cost to get tested like what are, what are some things people should know before they make that appointment so at columbus public health in our sexual health and wellness clinic or our women's health um, and wellness center um, 13 years mm -hmm. and older you can be tested and um you know, we we work with a lot of clients who are teenagers. I think another resource um, to consider um, is there are other uh, community resources like Equitas, like Out of the Closet, and you know, which is part of AIDS Healthcare Foundation, um, the Faces Clinic, which is at Nationwide Children's Hospital, are other areas where people can call first of all and just ask or mm -hmm. walk in. Uh, there are walk-in hours at many of these places, as with Central Outreach over on the hilltop on West Broad Street. There are walk-in hours and appointment hours for some of them. So, um, you know, calling us at the health department or looking up out of the closet and calling them and asking for an appointment and then getting there and really talking through what the concerns are. But we do work with teenagers who are tested, are treated, um, and it does not have to be billed like the parent insurance or anything. That's yeah. great. Yeah. That's great. I mean, it's great, especially because not everybody has reliable health insurance mm -hmm. too, right? So to know that you can just walk in and, you know, th th that'll get taken care of. That's great. Um, For I, my, my just general question about testing, um, I know it depends like where you go or if you're going to your uh, PCP or if you're going uh, to a clinic to get tested, but is that a conversation that doctors will have asking about like what you're getting tested for, if it's a urine sample versus a blood draw? Um, and like, how can you advocate for yourself to get like a full complete like testing? So I think that there just has to be a conversation that a person has to be willing to have with their provider. I think that when we talk about, 
young people and young adults and adolescents, I don't know that advocating for themselves is intuitive. Um, like you said, at 13, like talking to your parents about it, absolutely not. But I think that that is where it has to start, that you have to kind of know what to say. Um, I think that you have to be honest with your provider. If you tell your provider, hey, I'm sexually active and I need a full panel STI screening done. So typically they'll collect urine for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and trick. Um, and we would encourage everyone to have a blood draw for syphilis and HIV. So those are the things that, you know, you have to, you have to ask, but that is what it would look like. And we need um, everyone to understand because a lot of people, including some providers, don't understand. Urine is not enough for gonorrhea and chlamydia testing. Mm -hmm. Urine will show up, gonorrhea or chlamydia will show up in urine if it's in the urine, mm -hmm. right? If it's mm. in the urethral tract or if it's in the vaginal cavity. Yep. But if it's in the throat, it won't. Mm. If it's in the rectum, it won't. Yep. So it's really important and it can be embarrassing to talk about, I use my throat or I use my rectum, mm -hmm. but it's very important for our health. Again, these are our bodies and we're using mm -hmm. them. It's very important for our health that we find a provider who we can let know um, because not all providers think about that either. Right. They don't think, oh, I should swab that throat mm -hmm. because that might be where the gonorrhea and or the chlamydia is. Right. That might be where they look in and see, oh, those symptoms look like they could be, they could be syphilis down in there. Um, so we, we really have to start thinking about beyond just like peeing a cup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not enough when it comes to um, a really comprehensive test that's the right test for every person. Mm -hmm. That is so true. That is so true. And and I just, I mean, this will spiral, right? The more we talk about it, but it's like, you know, it just goes to show how like ha not having um, that education, not having that access to, you know, a primary care pr provider. Somebody mm -hmm. might think like, oh, well, you know, this might get brought up at a physical, right? When they say, are you sexually active? Or like, you know, how many partners, that kind of thing. Like these questions come up, but if somebody like doesn't have insurance, they're not going to see the doctor regularly and they don't know that they could access these things for free or to ask for blood and urine testing, whatever, you know, these things compound, I'm sure. And extra genital swabs, like Chuck said, a, a oral swab and a rectal swab. Right, Yeah. right. And so, you know, these are definitely barriers to, you know, recognizing this and mm -hmm. treating it and whatever, but what are some other barriers that you all find are like, you know, in place to, you know, the, which are the reasons why this has become, you know, a little bit more pervasive, pervasive of an issue? I really think that people just don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm going to stand on, I don't think that it is talked about enough um, and not in a way that conveys urgency. Mm -hmm. So it's not talked about. Um, the focus and attention um, has not been given to syphilis, hence why we have numbers. Um, I think that talking about sex or any sexually transmitted infection is still, there's still a stigma around it. Um, working at the health department has really given me an education that has allowed me to, I think, be more open um, to these conversations. But I really think that the stigma surrounding it and the lack of awareness. Mm -hmm. I, I think aside from maybe embarrassment and, and, and not knowing, um, some people just don't always know where to go. Where do I get a test? What, you know, what do I do? Um, so it, I think it's a matter sometimes of just that Google search engine, if I put in STD or testing or whatever, finding out places, but we're here today also to offer resources. And, and folks should know too, like here at KYC, we've had people from Columbus Public Health here to do STI testing. It's like confidential. It's not like, you know, we're spreading your results to the rest of the group, right? You know, so and to stay up to date on our calendar too, you can check out kycohio.org for when we do have that testing available here. But for folks who are coming to KYC for drop-in, y'all are just a uh, hop, skip, and a jump away <laughs> across the street too. So it's it's really convenient that you are here and that can, you know, help do that as well. Mm -hmm. And so after 
the testing, right? And the results come back. If someone needs treatment, I'm thinking specifically now for syphilis, but then just generally, like what does that kind of treatment look like? Oh, go ahead, Chuck. Okay, so the preferred treatment for syphilis d depends on how long you've had it. And, and if you've got those symptoms, we know you haven't had it very long, you know, m depending on the symptom, a matter of months. So that is a single shot of, uh, of a form of penicillin. Mm -hmm. When people are allergic to penicillin, then a pill, doxycycline, can be given. And it would be taken, if it's an early infection or you know, one of those symptomatic infections, it would be for twice a day for 14 days. Um, if we don't know how long you've had syphilis because you didn't have symptoms and you haven't had testing and your partners haven't had testing, then we have to give more medicine um, in case it's been in your body longer because it takes longer to cure it. Um, so that would be weekly shots seven days apart, three times. So mm -hmm. there'd be three. Um, and if you're allergic to penicillin, you would take that pill for four weeks, twice a day. Okay. Um, the problem right now is there is a, a nationwide shortage of that penicillin. Mm. So everyone is pretty much in most places getting the pill unless they're pregnant. Um, the only treatment for pregnant people and the only treatment for infants who are born um, exposed to syphilis is the penicillin. If someone's allergic and they're pregnant, they are desensitized in the hospital, it takes about six, eight hours, mm -hmm. and then they start the treatments. Um, and we, we've been arranging for that. Wow. So we help with that when it's needed. Um, so with gonorrhea, it, it is a shot. It's called rosepin. It's also known as ceftriaxone. It's a single shot. And then with chlamydia, it's normally going to be that pill, doxycycline twice a day for seven days. The alternative is Zithromax and it's given in, in pill form one time mm -hmm. um, So for chlamydia. Okay. So, the, so for those three that we're talking about specifically, those are the, the different treatment regimens. I, but all things considered though, like, I mean, in the absence of a, of a shortage, right? Which of course there's a shortage, everything mm -hmm. seems to have that these days. But um, it, it seems like it's a pretty like, you know, chill treatment. It's not like, you know, it's, you know, at worst, it's a prick on the arm for a vaccine. It's or not a vaccine, but a shot, right? Um, well, it's not. It's it's not in the arm. Okay. okay. <laughs> no, 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 this is, this is helpful information. It's in the arm. Right? It's, it's in the arm for gonorrhea. Okay. Okay. But it it is uh, given in the glute. Okay. Um, in the buttock for syphilis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's a little bit more of it. Sure. Um, so it needs to be administered there. Um, and you know, so not every, I've never met anyone who really wants to get a shot, but it's, it really does take care of the problem. Mm -hmm. And if you're not treated for syphilis, it can get into your brain. It can get into any organ cause it's in your blood. It can go through and destroy organs. It gets into the spinal fluid. We have people who lose vision. We have people who lose hearing. We have people who have had strokes that can happen at any point. Once you've got it, it doesn't necessarily take like months or years. Um, so the risk of not getting timely treatment for syphilis is life changing and it can actually be fatal and you know, mm -hmm. it can be life ending. Wow. So screening, 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 right? Know the signs and symptoms. Look at your body, screening, screening, screening. And, and right. All these considered like the awkwardness of you know, the potential awkwardness of having that screening, mm -hmm. having that conversation with your doctor and your partners is worth it versus like facing these other adverse effects of the disease too. Absolutely. The so it, we really appreciate you helping to spread awareness too, but I'm sure there are a variety of other things that Columbus Public Health does or like wants to raise awareness about. So while we have you here, is there anything else you want to make sure that listeners are aware of? CPH does phenomenal work, I think, um, in so many realms. Um, we really at CPH want to address social determinants of health. We have so many programs. CPH um, has taken a proactive stance that has said abortion is health care, that has said um, racism is a public health crisis. So we are very progressive at CPH. We do so many things. But one of the really great things we also do in the sexual health space is PrEP. Mm. So um, PrEP is something that we do at the health department. 
You can be seen by one of our providers. You can have your labs done and we are able to write you a prescription the same day. Um, we are able to point you in the direction of where to get these things filled. But just because, you know, we do that at CPH, a lot of our community organizations do that as well. So sure. Chuck kind of alluded to Equitas and Out of the Closet and Central Outreach. People okay, have so options yeah. and faces yeah. like yeah. there are options. Take his advice and hit the Google <laughs> right. search. Google will tell you a lot of stuff. Exactly. Do not use Google to diagnose yourself. No, <laughs> no. no I've never done that never. before. Please. Never. Um, but just to backtrack, right? Mm -hmm. So, could you talk to us a little bit more about prep? Like, what yeah. is prep? What is it used for? You know, mm. talk to us about that, just so folks are aware. So, prep is pre-exposure prophylactics. Um, I think about prep in my very layman's terms and Chuck is a wealth of knowledge. So he will like fill in all of my gaps. So when I have to explain what prep is to someone, I tell them, think about it like your once daily vitamin. So if you are an individual who is HIV negative and you would like to remain HIV negative, you would get prep, the pre-exposure prophylactic. You take it once a day. And science says that it works, you know? Sure. This is a very effective treatment for the prevention of HIV. Um, I think that you still need to be screened for other STIs just because you're taking PrEP, but PrEP is a very effective way to remain HIV negative. That's great. What would you add, Chuck? Yeah, and, there, and then depending on age and insurance and availability, there's also an injectable prep um, that yes. does not have to be taken every day. It's mm -hmm. taken over, you know, they're weeks, weeks and weeks apart. Mm -hmm. So that's something that um, to work out with a provider. And of course, there's going to be costs and insurance concerns. There can be some assistance programs for that as well. Yes. But prep, standard prep, the, the daily pill is free. That, that we, there are resources to help get that for free. Um, you know, so we, we do help people with access to those resources yes. if they need those resources. No one who has a concern about potentially having sex with someone they don't know is HIV positive, mm -hmm. or if they're in a relationship with someone they know is HIV positive, um, should have to worry about being able to get PrEP. It's there. Right. Well, and, and as far as folks who should like look into getting PrEP, who would that be? Like, who should be the top person who's asking their provider, like, can I get access to this, right? Well, again, if you're sexually active, mm -hmm. here we go. Mm -hmm. You know, if we look, if we go back to like statistics and, and talk about who is more likely to have an HIV diagnosis, obviously, if I had five people in a room and three of them were the demographic more likely to get a a diagnosis, I'd probably spend more time talking to them, but I'd still talk to everybody else mm -hmm. because anybody who's sexually active can get PrEP. Sure. Anybody who's sexually active can get any STI or HIV. But obviously sometimes we, we have clients um, that we might spend a little bit more of time with if we know a little bit more about them. Sure. That's, that's super helpful. And the reason why I ask these questions is, you know, just so people are aware, like, you know, oftentimes people will go into, you know, and myself included, you go to your primary care physician and you think like, okay, I'm here to, you know, get my annual flu shot or whatever. You know what I mean? It's like, you think you're there for one reason, and one reason only, and you think that there's some things that might not apply to you, or you don't even think to bring them up. And so it's great that, you know, you're able to share this with folks that like, hey, this is available to you as well. And it's super interesting too, because whenever I've heard of PrEP, just like in my own life, I've heard of people who is in, are in a relationship with someone who is HIV positive. And so they take PrEP in relationship, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I, this is the, the, which I mean, I guess I assumed that anyone could take PrEP, mm -hmm. but it's just interesting to hear now, like, it's a free pill. It's a, you know, like a daily vitamin. You can, you can just take it and it just protects you. Mm -hmm. it um, does. And you don't, it's not like you have to be in relation with someone. Like if you are sexually active period, like you can mm -hmm. just take it and protect yourself. Exactly. And, and we probably should also mention while we're talking about prep, PEP, um, if someone finds out they had an exposure to mm -hmm. someone HIV positive and they weren't aware of that mm -hmm. prior, um, Within 72 hours, there is a medication treatment plan mm -hmm. that you can get on. You get a test, 
and you get on this medication plan for four weeks and are tested again. It's called post-exposure prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. That's actually been around a lot longer than PrEP. And it's been around for... Your mind is blown. Did you know this? I did not. I Your mind is blown. And it, it's been used for decades for needle sticks in healthcare settings. Mm -hmm. It is also used uh, if someone is assaulted and they don't know the status of the person Sorry. or if someone has an exposure and learn, and, and what if the partner just tests positive like the next day or something. Mm -hmm. So it's called PEP and that is something that often you might need to go to a, a, an infectious disease provider or an emergency room because it is time sensitive. You yes. need to start it within 72 hours, three days of the exposure. It is highly effective. And then once, the, once you get through that period and remain HIV negative, then you can start PEP for the future. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to ignore PEP because a lot of people don't know about PEP. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. I'm so glad that you brought that up, too, because I, I think, you know, mm -hmm. it's crucial that people have this information even in their back pocket. Yes. Because you never know, like, you know, we always joke and say, hypothetically, you know, if a friend, whatever. But no, realistically, like, if you or a friend, like, help spread this information, too, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's by sharing this episode with a friend or sending a link to Columbus Public Health to a friend or like telling the people in your life about these things because that spread of information can only mm -hmm. help, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So PrEP is you being proactive. You are saying, I'm going to take PrEP because I am engaged. Um, I am sexually engaged with individuals and I am going to take PrEP and get screened. And then PEP, you say something has happened, a sexual assault, someone has revealed their status. I want to be, you know, mm -hmm. I want to be safe. Emergency departments, infectious disease for PEP. Mm -hmm. So PrEP, PEP. I, I appreciate that description for sure. Yes. Um, well, before we wrap up, I think like one other thing I want to make sure, you know, we've touched on this a little bit, I want to make sure you really hit the nail over the head, is just talking about like the stigma behind all of this and making sure folks who are listening are aware, totally aware that like, there's nothing wrong, right? Like this is, your, you have a body, if you're a person with a body, you know, this is something you need to be aware of. But is there anything that we haven't mentioned that you want to make sure people know, you know, relating to stigma or anything else maybe around this? Maybe we, in case some of the people who watch the podcast don't know or know someone who needs to know, is if we talk a little bit about trans health care. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, because we are very fortunate to have a lot of providers here in our area who provide trans health care, including to trans youth. Mm. So, um, you know, I can't make a, a referral or a recommendation, but just to name a few, we, I, while we see trans youth and trans adults in our clinics, obviously, mm. but Ohio State has a trans clinic, Equitas has a trans clinic, Out, Central Outreach has a trans clinic, and that in, these many times are including with teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we don't want to forget that what we're talking about here is not just um, applying to cisgendered males or cisgendered females, trans males, trans females. If you're a non-binary person, again, it, if I use my body for sexual expression with another human being, this conversation is for me. But Absolutely. there are specific providers who are sensitive to and understand the needs of our trans youth and our trans adult population, our young adults especially, um, to go along with their trans care, incorporating, you know, like with the hormone therapy and anything else that may be going on in your trans clinical care, sexually transmitted infection and HIV care and prevention as well. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up because that's absolutely relevant to many of the folks listening mm -hmm. to this podcast and beyond. Okay. I don't know. What would I say? I, um, I don't know. I think that um, the stigma and the shame surrounding sexually transmitted infections and screenings, um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, all of these things that we talked about today are manageable, if not curable. Mm -hmm. You just have to say, I need a screening. 
I guess that learning how to advocate for yourself, mm -hmm. um, working with individuals who understand you, I think is important because the stigma and the shame, mm -hmm. it keeps us where we're at. It keeps us in this bondage. It keeps us with these numbers escalating. Mm -hmm. So really working through the stigma and shame and knowing that you have support with Columbus Public Health, with the organizations that Chuck has talked about. You're not in this by yourself. Mm -hmm. There are people who are here and who are ready and who are able to help you and to provide you the services that you need and deserve and can do it with compassion and competency. Mm. So it's there. Absolutely. Just come on. Absolutely. I, I mean, I think that's a, a perfect note to end on um, unless there's anything else. No. no. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Yeah. So Thanks for, for being us. here. Thank you yeah. for being here. And I, I know I'm walking away with some information and I'm sure others are as well. Um, one final thing, it, how can people stay connected with Columbus Public Health? If they have questions, who can they reach out to? What's the best place to look? Depending on what the need is. Yes. Um, on, on our website for Columbus Public Health, all of the clinics are listed. So if, if maybe I need to get a vaccination, we have a immunization clinic. If mm -hmm. I need alcohol and drug services, which we really didn't talk much about today um, and does factor into this as well um, because the decisions sometimes people make that could affect their sexual health. Um, we have an alcohol and drug services program, mm -hmm. our sexual health clinic. All of those numbers are listed there um, as long as, as well as with numbers to make appointments on. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here. For folks who are listening, um, if you want to stay connected with Kaleidoscope Youth Center, you can follow us on all social media platforms at KYC Ohio. Um, if you want to learn more about our programming, for instance, when we do have SDI testing here at the Drop-In Center, um, as well as all of our other Drop-In Center programming, uh, you can find ways to volunteer, ways to donate, anything you might need to know about KYC, you can find at kycohio.org. Um, as always, send any questions to Mallory at kycohio.org. Um, we look forward to hearing your questions and to you know continuing this conversation in future episodes. So thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you.